Well, thanks very much for inviting me to come and uh, talk with you uh, this just about afternoon, isn't it? So um, I'm, I'm very pleased to have the chance to do that and look forward to um, an, a good discussion after my uh, remarks. I mean, even interrupt me if you want, that's absolutely fine with me too. Um, so it was a, that was a kind of introduction. I'd forgotten actually about the Rocket Networks thing. Well, I hadn't really forgotten about it, but it was an, a fascinating time. It was um, back in California in the days before the expression dot com was coined, and it was actually quite formative for me because we, I was got in, I got into that through um, a venture capital uh, company, a friend of mine in venture capital who wanted to put some money into a company that allowed musicians to play together on the internet. This was in the mid nineties, and. Um, I think the qualifications were I didn't have a ponytail and I did own a suit. And, um, and you know, so and, they, uh, and, I, and I could add up a bit. Um, so, you know, that sort of seemed to get me the job. But it, it, it was actually, it was really interesting and very useful because I learned an awful lot about raising money on the market. We went through three rounds of raising finance. I learned a lot about um, the differences actually between raising money in the UK and in the US and the attitude of people in the U UK and the, U and the US and it wasn't at all what I was led to believe I found the UK much more flexible people much more understanding than, uh, and I found a lot of the US telecoms companies very inflexible and you know it, so it was, it was quite good and it was quite good then to go through that whole um, dot com boom with that background as it were so it's quite telling but that's not what I'm going to talk to you about today um, just a, little, a couple of other points about my background that, as it were, shaped my views a little bit. I've been the uh, chair of um, a policy action committee, as we now call it, for our global organisation. So the, the trade associations in the tech sector around the world get together and form a global group called WITSA. And there are about um, 80 associations from, um, as I say, from South Africa to Taiwan, to, I mean, these days, South America particularly, a um, lot of activity there. And so I've had the chance over the years to uh, meet and talk to my friends uh, or, and make good friends all around the world who do similar jobs to mine and, and so talk to them about, well, what's your country doing about a digital agenda or what's your country doing about some aspect of the role of ICT? So it's been good to compare notes and I'll draw on a couple of those things uh, in my uh, remarks too, if that's okay. I'm also the uh, member of the um, council, the governing body at the University of Warwick and um, my, I'm paying for my accounting sins by being the chair of the audit committee, uh, which my finance director was very amused at the idea that I should chair the audit committee. But it, it, uh, being involved with the university for a number of years has also given me um, quite a good understanding of the whole sort of academic research and how academic research and then the, how that sort of research and the R&D supply chain works as well. And I think that's important for the uh, digital agenda with you know, the whole um, FP7 and Horizon 2020, you know, the, big, uh, um, the big commission funding scheme, as it were. So th those are um, also, as it were, shaped my views. So what I thought I'd do in the, well, I don't know, 25 minutes or so, we'll see how the time goes, I, I'd, I'd actually, rather than uh, address specifically that exam question, I might set myself a different exam question, slightly broader perhaps, and then come on to that topic in the context of it. And the, ex the way I look at this is, ICT, are they power tools for modern times? And if they are, what, what are the implications uh, of, of those power tools? And I thought I'd just start by recapping. I know we all, as it were, know these, but I thought I'd just recap on some of the, uh, the contextual, uh, situational things that affect how we use ICT in society and in the economy. And just as pick out some of the things that are going on today. Because I, th I do think um, you, you, you have to set your digital strategy or whatever it is within the context of the economic and social challenges that you have. And so it's important to just keep up with those. And so today, I mean, the, the first thing obviously you can't uh, ignore is the, what the Australians would call the global financial crisis, or GFC for short. Um, I was reading that the um, Eurozone unemployment figures are now at an all-time high of 10.8%. Um, I learned at the um, Digital Agenda Conference in Copenhagen that there are maybe another 12% who are freelance and a few more who are self-employed on top of that. 
And often, you know, I mean, it's obviously not completely the case, but some freelancers are there by for forced reasons. So mm-hmm. you might think, well, 10, 10.8% unemployed, maybe take half the freelance, what would that say, 16%? Well, you know, so those are serious numbers. And you, you will also know that in of Spain, I think it is, over half of the 18 to 24-year-olds are now unemployed. I mean, and, and we've seen that with our Spanish association, uh, for instance, have halved their headcount. And good friends of mine from down there now um, out of a job. And, you know, so, and we, all have, we all know people who are personally affected by this, don't we? Um, so we've got this, uh, we've got this these, um, economic crisis, and particularly the jobs crisis, and particularly jobs for young people. And I, and I think that's got to... You've got to think, well, if there's a problem I can solve with the digital agenda, that probably ought to be, near the, ought to be aiming near the top. Then there's the um, debate, the broad debate about, well, how, how do you deal with this? Is it austerity or is it some other measures? And we've seen uh, just in the last day or so the Dutch government uh, come a bit adrift with the, um, uh, the austerity line. Um, we've, I was hearing in the last couple of days that, uh, though, the, the view of the markets is that is if Francois Hollande mm. becomes elected. He's got four days to prove himself. This is what I'm hearing. That you know, if he, so this is what the, I don't know where this is coming from, but this is the sort of gossip: is that the markets will be giving him four days to prove that he's not an out-and-out left-wing villain. Um, what will happen then? I don't know. Downgrading of uh, downgrading of their status. Yeah. So that's what we hear. Um, then I think, and and all of these. Are, are things that I think ICT and related technologies have something to say to, which is why I raise them. Then I think there's the um, question about, well, even this economic model possibly is rather broken. The, the economic model of continuous growth is rather broken. And I don't know how many of you have read um, Nick Stern's book um, uh, on sustainability, I think, A Blueprint for a Safer Planet. Uh, uh, but, you know, he based that book on the work he did for Gordon Brown, looking at the, um, uh, looking at the um, policy solutions to climate change. And if you haven't read the book, it's a fantastic book, not just because it deals so thoroughly with the issue of climate change, but I think it's a tour de force in how you apply public policy to a major global problem, and it really is a fantastic book. And he and many, other arg- many others argue that um, we need a more sustainable economic model, both in terms of carbon footprint, but resource consumption too. And this is something I will say about something I will say about that. Then we got um, what some refer to as the democratic uh, deficit. I was in Athens on Friday on a panel with the uh, Greek Prime Minister and uh, the uh, Industry Commissioner, and the Commissioner, the uh, Prime Minister's advisor, opened with his. Uh, you know, his, his statement of the Greek problems were um, two, basically. We've got to stop spending so much money and we've got to get our enterprises going again. And when I was talking to my uh, friends after, the, this, uh, after this event or during the course of the event, um, they were saying that um, there's just no trust in politicians there. Mm-hmm. That there's, um, and what they expect to see in these next elections is um, a really fragmented political landscape uh, because that whole the whole uh, trust in politicians um, is really just broken down. Um, so you've got that, and of course we've seen other in Finland. We've seen it all over Europe, haven't we? This uh, the democratic. And I noted that. Uh, see, I did do a bit of homework. I noticed that uh, politics 2.0 is one of your seven key items on the, your agenda, and I guess. That's what I guess that's sort of what you mean to some extent by that. Um, I don't think it's too far fetched, by the way, to draw parallels between what's happening in some parts of uh, Europe with uh, what happened in the Arab world, um, and it's also <clears throat> interesting to see how this is seen from the outside. So back in, I think it was November time, I was asked to participate in a conference in Mexico with this global group that I mentioned. And they asked me if I would speak on a panel on the use of social media mm-hmm. and um, particularly how it, um, how it affected people's ability to engage and mobilise. And they said, um, what we going to want to, on this panel is we're, we're going to have some people from Egypt talking about what happened in Cairo and then something else. And we want you to talk about what happened in the London riots. So they were grouping these things. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a minute. <laughs> 
Uh, but you, you know, you, when when looked at from the outside, you can see how uh, yeah. people just see uh, the, um, the the way that uh, technology is being used to uh, stimulate sort of mass action very much um, more quickly. The, the guys from Egypt, by the way, put together this short video of um, of what happened in the uh, Egyptian problems, and and it, from a technology perspective, and it was really quite. There was one image really stuck in my mind. There were two guys sit, sitting on the floor by a garage door with their AK-47s in their hand, and there was a sign above them that said, "Give us back our Facebook." <laughs> and um, so it was, uh, you know, really quite telling. Um, I just wanted to, so, so carrying on just briefly on background for a moment, I, I also wanted to touch upon the, uh, the shift in the way that we're living in societies and, and in particular the uh, move into cities. We know that we passed the 50% of the world's population in cities a few years ago and the predictions are that maybe by 2030 two thirds of the world will uh, live in cities. And then when, when you combine that with the fact that more and more things are connected together and producing more and more data, whether it's uh, smart meters or, or your, um, simply your um, travel passes, you know, they're all spewing out lots of data. We, you can see the drive towards this um, smart cities, big data. And, and, and what was quite interesting in that regard is I was speaking to the uh, newly appointed, my newly appointed equivalent on the phone, I hasten to add, in Canberra, and uh, she said, oh, I've just done a poll of my members. So these, these are the, all the tech companies who are operating in the Australian market. And, I, and I've been asking them what their priorities are. I said, right, that's interesting, Suzanne, what, you know, what came out top? She said, oh, big data. And, I, and that actually did quite surprise me. I know it's an issue on the agenda, but to have it as the number one issue in Australia, I, th I thought, well, either that's a very good marketing pitch by IBM, could be, could be they are very good, uh, or, you know, they, they, really are, they really are seeing that. So uh, I mentioned a few things, all of which, to some extent, we know, the sort of uh, global economic crisis, the debate about is it stimulus, is it austerity, I've, I've touched on these uh, challenges about but the economic model is broken in any event and we need a more sustainable economic model uh, that deals with resource consumption and uh, what you might call carbon efficiency as well. I've talked about the democratic challenges um, and, the, and then something about the move into cities. And the reason I mention uh, pick all of those in a way is because I think ICT has something uh, to say about um, all of those and, and it can when one is thinking about how to construct um, a program, and we, let's not call it a digital agenda for a moment, but if you're thinking about how to construct a program that focuses ICT and the problems in a particular geography, I think those are some of the candidates that you ought to consider uh, as uh, target problems to fix or issues to deal with. And, and so let, let me, if I can, then... Um, Cut the, cut the cake a slightly different way to try and answer some of the, well, how would you do that then? Because, uh, as you said, Joyce, um, I, th I think when I talk to um, governments almost everywhere around the world, uh, the Mexican government, I was really quite surprised how advanced they were. Um, that everybody wants... The, the, they want to know how. The general sense I get is, look, we get, we, yeah, we, yeah, we get, we know, we know technology has a role. So, yes, yes, we get that. But we want to know how. We want to know... What do we do first? Um, what's worked elsewhere around the world? Mm. And where will we get the best return right now? And what are the practical steps mm. we, we, we want to take? And it, it's, we've got to, those of us in the industry have got to stop sort of going on about uh, we have the tools to solve your problems, problems because we've got to say, and this is how they are, and here's the practical steps, and this is what we're going to do to engage with you to fix those problems. We can't, we've got to go beyond the selling, I think, and start delivering. So let, let me uh, touch on the, uh, the things we might do in four areas. Um, first of all, uh, public service, um, and there's a subset of that about open data. Uh, something that's related to that um, social needs. Then the third topic would be um, resource and carbon efficiency. And then the uh, last but not least at all would be growth and jobs, and that would uh, pick up the digital single market in that. Um, now, so public, public service reform, and 
I guess um, one of the things that makes government really interested, uh, cynically, I'm afraid to say, in digital inclusion <coughs> is because they realize I was actually at a meeting in uh, number 10 where the Treasury guys admitted that they got it, they got the digital inclusion point because they realised they couldn't go digital if half the population wasn't online. It took them a while to get it, but now, oh, right, okay, well, that's why we need digital inclusion. Okay, get on the phone to Martha Lane Fox, get her to set up, I'm being slightly cynical now, but that's what got the Treasury behind it, you know, the needs must, because we can implement, and, you know, fair enough if that's what it, if that's what it takes. Um, but uh, digital inclusion is important if you're going to be able to use, uh, and you, you know the expression in the UK at the moment uh, at the top is digital by default, and that's the sort of, um, and I think that's, that's good, I mean to have that mentality is very good. So I've worked extensively in this area over the, over the last few years, it was a big thing in the UK for uh, the industry to work with government. You know, it's a huge market. I mean, nowadays, maybe 50% of the UK market, if you include the banks, it's probably nearly all of it. But uh, so, you know, it's 50% of the tech market in the UK is in the public sector in one form or another. So making that sector more efficient um, and taking the friction out of how the uh, public services used ICT was um, very, very important. Um, Interesting, comparing with my Greek counterparts, they said, well, you, we, could, we can't do that in Greece. So, well, why can you not do that in Greece? Well, they said, we just don't keep our politicians for long enough. And when the politicians go, <laughs> it's yeah, a bit like the American yeah. system. The top layer of the officials go as well. So they've got no motivation, mm. no follow-through, no, uh, no commitment to use, um, to use ICT. So it did as many things do, makes me think we're quite fortunate in some of the, mm. some of the countries in <coughs> Northern Europe uh, compared to uh, some of the ones where they have more difficulties. So um, public, public service reform, I think amongst this audience we all sort of get the fact that efficient modern public services are, if you play it right, they, they, they cost less and they deliver better results, so why would you not go for it? But I, I think something that I'd only twigged recently was, and this was as a result of the Commission inviting me to go and speak at a conference in uh, Poznan, in Poland, at the back end of uh, last year, on open data. Now, uh, open data is a big deal in the UK for um, transparency uh, reasons, but also t for market stimulation reasons. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of Europe, it's seen, and I think this is particularly relevant to say in Greece, it's seen as a way to hold government to account more easily because of the uh, transparency and open government that it brings. Mm -hmm. So it, it seemed to me that open data had got, you know, we had to get a big tick in any uh, digital uh, game plan because um, not, not, only, um, not, not only was it a big market, and I heard estimates in, in Copenhagen that the market might be as big, I don't know over what time scale I'm afraid, but um, 60 billion euros. I think that might have been a McKinsey report. And you, you do see already um, companies springing up using open data. And you already know that the issues around open data is that governments have to publish it in a usable form. They can't just, they can't just put the PDF of the data up, as it were. They've got to put it in a form that can be used uh, by people. But I, I, my eyes were opened to open data, as it were. And I think that's got to be an important part of any um, digital, digital game plan. And, and I think it's particular enthusiasm among those governments where there hasn't been so much transparency and there hasn't been so much accountability and democratic <laughs> control. I think there, there's a real appetite driven by the, a, a sort of open government approach. And I was, quite, I was quite taken by that. I also think on this public service open data, uh, there's a big opportunity for the smaller companies. And again, you, you will know, I'm sure, that the UK is in a massive push on trying to put more business uh, out to SMEs. And uh, when pushed to give targets, obviously they get a bit coy about this, but they, they'd like a quarter of all government business by value to go to SMEs. They're not going to commit to it because then they'd have to measure it and then people would say you haven't made the target. But, um, but they've, I, I think they've taken some quite impressive steps towards trying to uh, promote uh, the deployment of, of SMEs. And there are some actually some quite neat tricks I've seen around the world of governments that have done that well. And if, you, you know, if it's an, an area that interests you, I think the best one I've ever seen 
is the state of Victoria in Australia. And do you know what the trick there was, or the thing that made it happen, was that the same guy was responsible for the government as a customer end with SMEs. So he had the job of getting SMEs into government. And he also had that sort of industrial policy uh, responsibility of trying to make the SME community more successful. And so because he had both hats, as it were, he made it work. And he took, he took millions of dollars, millions of Australian dollars, out of the cost of government doing business with SMEs and SMEs doing business with government with some quite simple things like saying, you, your bid document has got to be no more than six pages and here's a pro forma for it. Um, you know, just things like that. Um, and the SMEs, oh, that's fantastic, it's going to save us a fortune in bid costs. So those little tricks. So I do think public service used well and play within the rules, uh, you know, can still stimulate the mm -hmm. SME, um, the SMEs in the local SMEs. So I think, I think that's a good one. So, um, so that's public service and open data. Let's move on to a couple of things on uh, social needs. Now, I've always been, um, being associated with Warwick University, you might expect this, but I've become a fan over the last few years in this whole concept of happiness economics. Mm. Now, people rather dismiss it as a, a bit of a fad, you know, where did that come from? But actually, if you look behind the, behind the words happiness economics, it, it, it's, it's actually a device to ensure that your public policy is pointing in the direction of what your society really wants. What is it that people, what do people want to be happy? And you, mm. you, know, you can debate what happy means, but, but if people soon understand what that means. It does mean security, it does mean good health care, it does mean good education, it means those things. So um, if, you, if you sort of follow public policy from that point of view and social needs as defined in happiness, you can then start to say, okay, well, how do we apply tech to some of those. And, and some of the um, good examples I've seen, and uh, forgive me if this is another UK story, but um, the Prime Minister launched uh, with my old association a few months ago something called Three Million Lives. And it was based on the trial that uh, the industry had run with the health services using ICT and related technologies to care for people, to help in the care for people with long term chronic conditions, of whom there are huge numbers, huge numbers. And, and so it not only improved the quality of the care, but it reduced the cost of delivering that care. And you can look at other examples. I mean, you will know many in education. I was very impressed, by the way. There's a, an Austrian group of schools who are leaders in the use of uh, education in schools. They really, they've gone one step beyond anything um, I've seen. And uh, so, so you can see how it can help with uh, education, uh, with health, and also with this um, assisted living as the demographics change and uh, we have more older people uh, in our society. You can see technology in all of those. And I absolutely believe that if you're going to have a digital game plan anywhere, it's got to deal with those social challenges. And, it, and if it doesn't, you won't get the impact in your society and it, and it will be seen as some sort of nerdy thing for SMEs or some, you know, techies or, or something. So that to me, you know, it's really important that you address those. So, so my, my third area is uh, this, um, the Nick Stern stuff, the um, climate change, resource efficiency, um, carbon efficiency. And there, I think the story falls into two parts. There's the part of what can ICT do to reduce the carbon footprint of what we might call the bad guys, the big, big emitters. And um, some work that the European Association did some years ago, it um, produced a report called High Tech Low Carbon, and they looked at what you could do with the smart use of ICT to reduce the carbon footprint in transport, energy production and distribution, and in the buildings, uh, buildings area. And, the Commission was taken with that back then that they actually set up their own program to look at bringing together the ICT industry. Um, and that, that goes on today. And in fact, next week, there is, and I mentioned this idea of smart cities earlier, there is a, two, a big two day conference in Brussels, I think, with four commissioners involved on the whole issue of ICT, sustainability, and smart cities. And they're really taking this uh, very seriously. But from, um, from an, the other side, so there are two parts of this, there's ICT as it reduces the carbon footprint of, of, 
for the, the bad guys. But then there's also what's the ICT industry doing itself to reduce its own carbon footprint. And that's, that has always been an issue, but it's become more of an issue of late. Um, again, I think because uh, the industry has been saying for so long, um, we could help these other people, you know, it's been selling its sort of messages. And officials tend to get a bit tired of that sort of story and say, well, okay, yeah, but what do you do to put your own house in order? And um, one of the things in particular that uh, the officials are, have been concerned about is how do you measure carbon footprint of the industry? <coughs> and so they commissioned um, three pieces of work, three parallel pieces of work with different institutes and agencies. Um, the ITU was one, um, the uh, SC was another, you know, the Telecom Standards Institute in Nice um, were another to look at how would you measure the carbon footprint of the industry. And the Commission took this quite seriously. They're putting money into some pilots to work with companies who are then going to try these methodologies. And I think we'll hear more about that at this uh, event next week. So, so that's two sides of the carbon footprint story. And then in, in parallel to that, there's the whole resource efficiency. So how do you use fewer natural resources in the production and use of your products? And the, um, the Commission produced a roadmap back in September, and our, our industry, the ICT industry, is now looking very hard at um, how we can um, work with that roadmap, how we can deliver our own uh, best practice and guidance, and indeed how we can improve our own resource efficiency, because you know the industry is dependent on many rare earths and metals that are in seriously short supply. So I think there's a, a, good, uh, a good story to tell on, um, on resource and carbon efficiency. How are we doing? Sorry. Um, so let's move to this, uh, the last point, probably where you asked me to start in a way, really. Um, Yes. And I've described this as sort of jobs and growth through and in our industry. And uh, so let, let's take again, let's take this in two parts, through and in our industry. Now one of the things that I think has been missing in the debate about um, economic growth is the role of ICT improving the productivity of companies in the economy. And Improving the, if you think about it, improving your productivity is pretty much the only way that an economy can become more competitive, mm -hmm. unless you're going to reduce everybody's wages, which of course one or two have tried with a bit of a backlash. Um, so if you if you're going to become a Western economy is going to become more competitive in the world, it's got to become more productive. Probably the best way to become more productive is to use ICT. If you analyse different sectors, you'll see that some sectors have been very good at becoming more productive and others have, become, have been less good. And th there's certainly there's some work that's been done in the UK that shows that big productivity gain leading to big competitiveness improvements could come if the worst sectors simply got as good as the best. Um, now, that's not something just for governments, by the way. I think that's where organisations like the employers' organisations, um, the BDI in Germany or the CBI, I don't know what it is in the moment. IBEC. IBEC, okay. Well, you need, you need organisations like that who are um, working with the tech sector to say, let's pick off some sectors where we could work together to maybe get a productivity roadmap. And I think that ought to be part of any digital game plan too, because that improves productivity, competitiveness, and ultimately then allows people to create new jobs and employ people. I mean, it seems to me they're the only sustainable sort of jobs is where you are genuinely internationally competitiveness, or competitive, sorry. And then, of course, the, there's the other side of that coin. That if you then have um, a threat, and there's a piece of economist research, by the way, that shows that the, the countries that do best in exploiting technology for productivity improvements and others, and, but also for public sector, the, the, the geographies and countries that do best are the ones that have a strong tech sector in their own right, that there is a relationship between them. And of course, it sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Because uh, if you are, as an economy, relying on um, simply deploying, um, as Nelly Cruz says, you are just using your credit card to buy US technology, um, 
then you're not going to have those innate, you're not going to build up those innate skills to know how to use the technology to best effect. So Pat, I think it's a strong argument for governments. You need a strong tech sector in your economy because otherwise you won't make the best use of it. And it can be a great source of jobs in its own right. So do give tender loving care to your tech sector. It will pay you. It will pay you. You will get the returns from doing that. So to the sort of, as it were, the exam question, a digital single market, does that matter? Well, I thought it was quite interesting in Copenhagen, uh, which was the Danish government's, um, you know, they have a presidential, each presidency has decides on what conferences it wants, and nearly everyone has a digital agenda conference, because it's a bit cooler than the others. And um, so, of course, they, they had one. And um, they asked me if I'd... Act, it's an awful job, it really was. They said, would you, would you um, follow one of the two tracks through the whole conference and then summarise at the end? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, well, I, so, but it doesn't make you concentrate exactly. a bit harder. And um, actually what I concluded at the end of that was, in fact, there were two conferences in one. There was one that was genuinely on what you might call the digital single market and the other was on quite a lot of the stuff I've just been exactly. talking about today because it all gets rather muddled up. And... So I, I, I think the digital single market, it's certainly necessary, but it's not sufficient. It, it, it's important, but it's not the whole answer. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know, if I'm honest, that I believe the 4% GDP growth that would come from a digital single market. I don't know how good the science is that underpins that. But that, that's not to say that I, don't, that I have any doubts about the core elements. And I think the core elements of a, of a digital single market are you, you clearly need that high-speed broadband and you clearly need um, wireless to be a, an important part of that. I was saying earlier how the, the demands on the wireless network these days are just growing apace, aren't they? Um, so you, you, do, you certainly need that enabling infrastructure. Um, you certainly need uh, digital skills, and we'll perhaps come back to that in a moment. And you know, when you think of, um, think of trying to think of sort of practical examples of markets that would not thrive as well or won't thrive as well because there isn't a, a, a European digital single market, the best example I can think of is this nascent European cloud computing uh, industry and you, you can you can quite see and I've talked to people who are in this business that you can get a cloud computing business going say in uh, in Denmark but it's a bit difficult if you then want to operate in Germany and it's a bit more difficult if you also want to operate in France I'm talking to one guy so just the data protection uh, regimes in those countries and understanding them is enough to put them off and they come up with this number that to um, expand into the States for this particular company was going to cost them a million dollars, just a sort of investment. And, but to expand into any European country was going to cost them at least as much. So which would they do? So their, their thinking was, the market opportunities are bigger in the US than to expand piecemeal around, uh, around Europe. Will we ever solve that? I think, we, I think it's a long game, isn't it, really? It's a, it's a long game. It's a laudable ambition, but it does seem to me that there are probably other things that we could concentrate on that would give us um, a faster return than trying to solve whole all of these things. That I emphasise, though, I do think we should pick things off and try and solve them when we can, and I think the data protection review at the moment is one of those, because if we can have more harmonised data protection and we can have lower administrative burdens, it will knock one of the things off that would make this guy say, maybe it's only 800,000 now, not a million. You know, and I think if you could start chipping away at something like that, that's the way I would see the um, digital single market. Um, I can't remember. There's a woman who uh, worked for WEF, and I could probably give you the reference afterwards, but the, who just produced a very good report, Lisbon Council, just produced a very good report on the, um, the real challenges of the digital single market. And I think it's probably one of the best I've seen. And she was in Copenhagen talking about it as well. So if you really want 
um, a sort of another think tank's view. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you allow yourself to look at the yes, think tank? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the competition. Um, I, I think that's a, a good, <laughs> a good piece. Absolutely, always <laughs> a good piece of work. So let me um, recap on those sort of wanderings. I, I laid out some of the sorts of social and economic challenges, and I argued that if you're going to have a digital game plan of some sort, it's got to, you've got to think which of those are the biggest challenges that we we want to solve, where we think ICT and related technologies can be brought to bear. And I, I really do think you have everybody has to think about that. And as I've talked to people around the world, I've seen them do that. I mentioned before we started to you that I've seen um, the Malaysians have a fantastic... I mean, OK, in these controlled economies, you can be a bit uh, more autocratic about it. Um, but they've got a fantastic uh, plan. The... the some of the states in Mexico have got fantastic plans. Um, some of the Australian states have got great plans. You know, you can almost everybody around the world has got some sort of digital game plan, and and I think if you're going to construct one, you have to look at where you're going to get the maximum return and where do you want to encourage ICT to focus to solve the problems and create the opportunities that you've got. And you should certainly look at all the work that's been done in the Commission, but I think you do your own thinking once you, you, know, once you play into that. And then, then I, want to leave you, I want to leave you with one thought, <coughs> apart, apart from, or, or one additional thought, not one thought, it'd be nice if you remember some of the other stuff as well, but one, one additional thought, which is something about, um, I don't know, something about we've got to be careful to be, uh, have a little bit more humility as an industry, and I, maybe I'm talking to myself and others who represent the industry. Um, I was, re was reading in the, um, a magazine, a Belgian magazine recently, and sort of the headline was Technology One God Zero. And what they were reporting on was the Pope's speech on Easter Sunday, where he was saying people are devoting too much time to technology and not enough to uh, spiritual, spiritual and human needs. And I, I thought, my goodness, technology makes it into the Pope's speech. That's, we should, we should pay attention to those sorts of things. And um, you do know that as we go along on this sort of crusade of tech can fix everything, I, I do think we've got to be careful that we're not the sort of missionaries of old, bringing our bugs with us, you know, as, as the missionaries did when they went to Tasmania or wherever. So I do think we have to be a bit sensitive to where, when we apply these power tools into solving these problems, we probably there are some things there are going to be some side effects and we need to we need to pay attention to what those side effects are and not just blindly blithely ignore them um, as I think sometimes as an industry we, we have done so um, maybe the way you draw all that together is maybe it's time for a think tank like yours or to to actually produce a, a new digital commission um, where you you genuinely look at what well, what are the opportunities that mm. can be solved through ICT mm. that affect uh, you, however you want to define uh, you, and maybe look at also then what might be the side effects that you cause and how might you mitigate any mm. uh, damage um, that you might cause as a result <coughs> of such a, a digital game plan. So I hope I've given you something of a... Uh, you know, canter through the world as I see it from uh, that, that ICT perspective and I hope I've answered some of the questions and I'm very happy to answer any other questions that you might have in whatever time. <laughs>